a disc. We use this kind of disc to play Ultimate Frisbee. It's made out of plastic, it weighs 175 grams, and it mostly doesn't hurt when you catch it correctly at full speed. Mostly. I lived for many years in the United States, and while there are many wonderful things there, one thing that's jumped out at me recently is the complete inability of people to listen to other people different from them, particularly in politics. This polarization has become the norm around the US, and unfortunately, is coming to the rest of the world as well. So, what does this disc have to do with empathy? Well, personally, this 175 gram piece of plastic taught me how to listen to people that I disagree with. It brought me out of my own echo chamber. And today, I hope it'll encourage you to do the same. Several years ago, I heard about an amazing nonprofit in the Middle East which coaches Ultimate Frisbee to kids from across the region. Ultimate Frisbee is a non-contact sport that I've been playing for about a decade. One thing that's really special about it is that it's a sport with no referees, which means that we have to talk. Problems do arise on the field, and when they do, we speak with the other team directly without any intermediary. You can see how this sport would lend itself to helping people practice communication. So the goal of the nonprofit was to use Ultimate Frisbee to create friendships from very different and often completely segregated communities. It's good to be ambitious. This program teaches kids through the year in after school programs, in a monthly leaders and training program for older teens, and a yearly week long summer camp, which gathers over 300 local kids and teens and over 100 foreign volunteers such as myself. So can Frisbees really create friendships? You'd be surprised. Every year, we have success story after success story of connections between kids from different communities, sometimes even across language barriers. Language is a big challenge at camp. There is not one common language. Everything must be translated from English to Hebrew or to Arabic or vice versa. Camp is a hot, long, exhausting week, but we do everything for the kids. So the goal of the nonprofit is to change the kids' lives, but ironically, it also changed mine. Barely three days after the end of my first week of camp, I found myself taking an evening walk around Jerusalem, all alone. As I meandered throughout the city center, a young Hasidic man approached me and asked me for directions in Hebrew. I shrugged and said, sorry, I don't speak Hebrew. Oh, that's okay. He said, I'm American too. Uh, do you know where this street is? I looked him up and down, thought for a minute, and said, no, I don't have self-service either, but I can help you look for it. And we started walking and talking. Pretty soon, I realized he wasn't really looking for that street. He just wanted to hang out and then began the most interesting conversation I've had probably in my whole life. We talked for almost four hours. I asked him about his childhood, about his family, about his dreams, about his understanding of the world. I asked him how many white button down shirts he owned, what it was like growing up without the internet, without a television, what dating was like for him, if he was happy in his life, yeah was. When he made some pretty intolerant remarks, I didn't start screaming at him. I didn't call him out. No nagging. No shock. No, well, that's just not okay. No tone. Even when he told me things like women have no business playing sports. Um, even when he made disparaging comments about other groups of people. For instance, he wasn't really impressed that I had just spent a week with Arabs, Jews, and other people from around the region. But what shocked me the most wasn't the things he said, it was my reaction to them. Instead of laughing in his face or being horrified, which I know I would have done several years ago, when he told me, hasn't science been proven wrong? I instead asked him, well, what do you know about science? Tell me, I'm not asking, you know, to trick you, just really, what do you know about science? How do you think it works? And I listened to his answer, 
and then shared my understanding of how science works. I asked question after question, not seeking to rock his world or anything, but really out of genuine curiosity. It's not every day you get to have a conversation with someone like that. For instance, I asked him, can someone who is not as religious as you are still be a good person? That led to an interesting conversation. And I listened. I heard the answers of a person who genuinely believes every word that he said, was genuinely scared for his life in some parts of Jerusalem, and sincerely thought that people from outside of his own group wanted to hurt him. My questions were not challenges. They were just that, questions. I knew one evening of questions wasn't gonna change the course of either of our lives, but I tried to answer honestly and thoughtfully when he asked me questions about my life. Neither of us was trying to convince the other. We were just presenting our views of life to the other. From this conversation, I learned that I can be faced with people and ideas that I fundamentally disagree with and still talk, still listen, and still have empathy for them. Despite this young man's ideas, some of which I really don't agree with, I still wish him well. Listening to someone does not mean endorsing their ideas, nor does engaging in actual conversation with a perceived enemy make anyone an apologist for their behavior. I'm also not saying that everyone is right all the time. While the experience of a situation may be subjective, some truths remain objective. It's not like I have no beliefs, and I think everybody is always right. Shortly after my time in the Middle East, I attended an equality protest in a completely different country. There, uh, the protesters I was with were attacked by counter protesters, and the riot police protected us from the worst of it. Eventually, they had to pull out water cannons to disperse the counter protesters. For the first time in my life, I went home, having been merely attacked, and instead of feeling victimized, instead of feeling bad, instead of feeling sorry for myself, or being angry and thirsty for blood, for revenge, I felt something that echo chambers don't allow you to feel. I felt sorry for the other side. All those people who had come to our march to throw insults, throw rocks, even throw tomatoes at us. They went home angry. They brought that anger home and they took it out on the people around them. And of course they were angry. They had been told that the beliefs that we were protesting for were threatening their way of life. None of them was interested in asking questions, in checking whether we actually were a threat. Nobody, at least on their side, learned anything that day. There are so many stories around the world, even on this platform, of people who were raised or joined early on in their lives, cults, extremist organizations, some of them violent criminal organizations. Some were brainwashed by idealistic and charismatic leaders. But when such people talk about leaving that past behind, they never once say, yeah, you know, one time I went to an event and a counter protest me counter protester hit me in the face. And when I got up and saw the blood on my face, I thought, huh, my actions are harming other people. I should stop. Not a single person says something like this. Inevitably, what every individual who shares this story about getting out, they share a story of being heard outsiders to their movements take the time to listen to them. These people, these outsiders, had empathy. They had patience. And these people were able to share their story and they were listened, they were heard. Even if the outsiders disagreed, they didn't judge or call them out, publicly shaming them. them. This is the point I'm trying to make. Our society is feeling more and more divided less and less interested in dialogue. Echo chambers grow stronger every single day on all sides of every debate because we don't know how to empathize, especially in the West. The way we are being asked to approach conversation today is anything but communal. 
We're supposed to know more, but shamed for asking questions. How are we supposed to learn? We're told that others' ideas are dangerous, when in fact, it's the decision to act on those ideas that is dangerous. Shouldn't we want to learn more about both the decision and the, deci and the actions? Empathy is a practice, a constant practice, constantly checking ourselves and our judgment. Does this person's actions hurt my life? No. Then I believe that it is their freedom of speech to say things even if I find them fundamentally wrong. And if I truly want to practice what I preach, it is my responsibility to try to understand what this person is saying, where they are coming from, and acknowledge that I could be wrong about my own beliefs. Thanks to this disc, I was able to return to the Middle East for a second year of volunteering. Now that I knew what to look for, I saw my friends, co-volunteers, the kids I worked with, and day in and day out, I saw them trying to practice empathy. Sure, it doesn't always work. In fact, it's a really difficult skill to have. I myself try day after day and I'm not always successful. But I feel calmer, more at peace. Now that I understand even just a shred about society, just a shred more about society, just from listening. The world is more confusing outside the echo chamber. It takes more time to discriminate between what I think is right and wrong, but it's also richer, closer to the truth, more real. So the next time you're available for a four hour walk in an ancient city, I'd love to hear your story.